Hello, Soil for Climate community. Uh, I'm Carl Tiedemann, co-founder of Soil for Climate, and I'm here today with Dr. David Montgomery, a geomorphologist from the University of Washington. Uh, many of you may know him from his works, including uh, dirt, um, the, the, the kind of erosion of the ero civilizations. I think part yes. of dirt, the erosion of civilizations, uh, the hidden half of nature, a book he co-authored with his wife Anne Bickley, and uh, growing a revolution, which we uh, have here today. And whoops, I'm just getting used to left and right. It goes backwards. Field. It goes backwards. Um, and uh, we're excited to be here today at the Soil Not Oil uh, Conference taking place in the Mission District of San Francisco. Uh, David and his wife Anne will be delivering a keynote presentation uh, this evening. And uh, we're sitting outside, as you might tell. So apologies for any background noise or if our hair gets blown around a bit too much by the wind. Yeah, um, but it's a nice day in the mission, so. Absolutely beautiful afternoon. Could not have asked for a better one. And uh, thank you all for tuning in and for being with us today. Um, I'd like to begin by asking Dave a little bit about his background and how it was he got the soil bug in the first place and what, what drew you into this field of study and- Sure, well, it, it, it's a, um, uh, slightly by accident in the sense that I'm a geologist by training. So I was trained to study rocks, not soils, but I uh, got into the uh, book writing game for uh, popular audience books with uh, an environmental history of salmon. And that focused on erosion and the destruction of salmon runs in Europe and North America, and then ultimately the Pacific Northwest where I live uh, in Seattle. But I then got into thinking about what to do for next book. And I focused on the, the, the role that soil erosion and soil degradation played in the demise of ancient civilizations. So I really got into thinking about soil from how rocks become soil and how soil is lost, which is sort of the opposite of where I've ended up thinking about how do you build healthy fertile soils and how do you reverse the decline of soil, de of soil quality, soil organic matter, soil itself. Um, and do so through intensive farming practices. So I sort of got into thinking about soils and thinking about farming from a direction that's, you know, I think, fairly unusual for people who are involved in regenerative agriculture, but it's due to my background and training. Um, so I've learned a lot from farmers in the last few years working on and writing books about soil restoration and regenerative farming. Um, but it come at it really from the rocks up rather than from the top down. Excellent. When I was reading your book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, um, I, I kept wondering, when is it going to get to the part where it talks about healing the land and reversing <laughs> these trends? And I didn't realize I had to wait until a couple of books later. Yeah, um, well, that wasn't, I didn't plan that. <laughs> it wasn't on your radar at <laughs> no. the time. Um, but I think the personal story of, of how you came to learn about soil restoration is quite fascinating. Uh, perhaps you could share that story with our viewers. Uh, sure, and I actually struggled to write the last chapter of the Dirt book, the first book in what Ann and I call our Dirt Trilogy, The Dirt, Hidden Half of Nature, Growing Revolution. Um, and I struggled with it because when you look back through history, the story of how people have degraded land and society after society in different regions around the world is actually a pretty depressing tale. Um, and I struggled with how to frame that in the last chapter in a way that wasn't completely depressing because by inclination, I'm a relatively optimistic guy. And I, I struggled with it. I went through three drafts of that chapter to actually get to one that I was comfortable with. It took me the next 10 years to really get to the point of writing the optimistic sequel, the Growing Revolution book. There's a long story that goes through how that really worked. But it basically went from taking my experience, looking at soils and soil degradation around the world and how societies that had impoverished land were themselves impoverished multiple generations past the point of where the people who were doing the impoverishing were still alive. Um, and then we, Ann and I bought a house in North Seattle that came with a yard that had, in hindsight, terrible soil. We had dirt, not soil. There was not a single worm beneath the lawn when we pulled it off to make a garden. Um, and Ann is a biologist, she's a gardener, and it, she took it on herself as her sort of mission to build a verdant garden out of this degraded yard. And in so doing, she restored fertility to the land. She rebuilt healthy fertile soil you know, right outside the back door at our house where I could not help but notice it, where she could not help but notice it. And we started thinking about, hmm, could this be done at scale on farms around the world? You know, could we generalize this? What were the principles? And so we delved into the world of microbial ecology, the world of soil building. We delved into interviewing farmers around the world who had already 
embraced regenerative agriculture and rebuilt health, the health and fertility of their land. Look what they did to it and how they did it and tried to look at what are the common elements. So there's this sort of personal story that's outlined in the three books about how our own awareness and thinking evolved through starting to look at the degradation of soil to understanding the new science of microbial ecology that is really behind the role that soil life plays in building healthy fertile soils and then translating that into the practices that can actually rebuild soil organic matter and rebuild the carbon content of soils and thereby increase their fertility um, and reduce farmers costs for things like diesel, fertilizer, uh, pesticides, three of the big expenses that modern conventional farmers have. So a big part of that optimistic sequel, the Growing Revolution book, is looking at how do you actually operationalize regenerative farming in ways that work not only for the land, but for the farmers. And that's what really turned me into an optimist, was seeing how the reduced expenditures for fertilizer, diesel, pesticides, patented seeds, the big expenses of modern farming, could actually lead to much more profitable farms, even if yields dipped a little bit, and they come back as the soil is Um, even in the transition period, farms can be more profitable because they're spending so much less to grow what they do grow. So there's sort of a long story there, but it's been an interesting and fun experience where I've learned a lot, not only from my wife and her garden and her skills as a plant whisperer, but also from uh, the farmers that were kind enough to share the experience with time with me. Um, and we're now sort of interested in what is the effect of regenerative agriculture on growing more nutrient dense, more nutritious food for people. Um, and that's the book that Ann and I are working on now that we're hoping to finish up by this this time next year. Great, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of my favorite stories that I recall hearing as you and Ann were building the garden in your backyard was that you would try to get organic matter from as many sources as possible, <laughs> uh, including from uh, you know uh, leaves in, from other people's yards or if they were people chipping trees in the neighborhood, or, uh, or even being in Seattle, there were quite a few coffee shops, so they were spent coffee grounds, and I recall at one point, and correct me if I'm telling the story wrong, um, but uh, you were working out in your yard one day, and uh, you ended up putting a shovel down and hitting a worm, and the aroma of espresso filled the yard. And so the, the question was, you know, whether it was just the worms or were they caffeinated? Is that why they got the job done so quickly? Well, I, I think they were caffeinated. The, 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 their aroma really uh, revealed that they had been digging those coffee grounds. Um, and that was quite a surprise to me. Um, probably as big, a bigger surprise than the worm, of course. But, um, so so but tip, yeah. tip all the vermicomposters out there. Make sure <laughs> yeah. you add the coffee beans in for faster results. Get them going, going fast, yeah. But yeah, no, Anne really uh, tried to get organic matter from wherever she could. And then the coffee shops were good ones because they put their spent coffee grounds out behind uh, the coffee shop at night. Gardeners come in the dead of night, take the stuff away. And it's, it's a really rich source of nitrogen. It's actually sort of very nit um, natural fertilizer. But you'd want to mix it with a carbon source, you know, and wood chips. The, the wood chips and coffee ground combination was, was pretty good. Um, but she also, uh, you know, ended up getting some herbivore manure, which is hard to come by in the city unless you have a zoo. And we live fairly close to the Seattle Zoo. So we got, she literally took my truck over and got a truckload of what's called Zoo Dew, which is the composted herbivore turds from the Seattle Zoo, which is an amazing fertilizer. It's, it's, it's quite good stuff. Um, and they need to get rid of a lot of it every year. Excellent. And so you mentioned the work that you're doing now is looking into the nutritional aspects, uh, essentially confirming that the thesis that healthy soil translates into healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. And uh, you mentioned when we spoke earlier uh, that your wife is working um, with Dr. Fred Provenzo now. Uh, yeah, she and Fred are working on an article together. Um, and we're, we're basically trying to take that um, connection of the soil health to plant health to livestock health to human health break it into those individual pieces and go, what's the science behind connecting those dots? Um, how, what can we legitimately say? And can we, can we, how much can we say that regenerative farming practices grow food that's more nutrient dense, that's, that's more nutritious for people? And this is something that we're basically you know, doing the research on now, engaged in, we're doing a little bit of testing ourselves. One of the things we've been very frustrated about is how little data there is out there in the published literature that's been framed right. Most of the comparisons are organic versus conventional. 
And we, I've been on enough organic farms that have literally destroyed their soil. And that dirt book that we were talking about, uh, you know, when, when the Roman, when Roman farmers destroyed the land of central Italy, they were organic farmers mm -hmm. um, and they did it by plowing too much. So if you, if there's ways to degrade the land, even as an organic farmer. And I've been on organic, modern organic farms that have done that, that have very low organic matter content, low soil life, but they don't use chemicals. Um, I've also been on some conventional farms that have some pretty good soil management practices that are legitimately regenerative farms that have taken their soil from less than 2% organic matter back up to 5, 6, 8% or higher in some cases, and that have an abundance of life in the soil and where the farmers are using very little um, nitrogen, very, you know, very little chemical fertilizer, very little pesticide. Um, and so when you look at the, the, the meta studies that have been done out there in the literature on comparing organic versus conventional agriculture, those studies lump the best of the conventional farms with the worst of the conventional farms and the worst of the organic farms with the best of the organic farms and they compare the distributions. And they often will find overlaps and not a lot of difference in things like the major elements or, or mineral micronutrients. Some studies do, particularly some of the, the very closely controlled paired studies. But um, there's a lot of um, uh, confusion, I think, out there be based on those kinds of meta studies because what people have not been doing is controlling for the health of the soil. And so we're trying to do some studies where we'll actually compare farms that have low soil health and high soil health and look at the mineral uh, density, the mineral micronutrient density of the crops and some of the phytochemicals in the crops. And when you think about the major elements, the things that most nutritionists sort of consider the primary nutritional elements of nutrition, it's kind of hard baked into the genetics of plants as to sort of what major elements to take up. And most soils have most minerals available. Not always true. Um, sometimes you definitely need to supplement with mineral micronutrients if they're just not in the parent material for the soil. But sort of trying to wrestle through all that and synthesize it and look at what really is the effect of soil health and soil quality on the quality of the food that's produced and how much does that matter actually for our own health and our own nutrition that's what we're wrestling with with the new book uh, we think it's going to be called you are what your food ate huh. um and that's we'll, we'll see how, how that goes through the process of writing it but we're excited about it it's a fun, it's a fun topic it's really interesting and we um are looking forward to getting it done i've heard you use the term organish uh, oh yeah, organic-ish. Yes, organic -ish. Uh, I used organic-ish in the Growing a Revolution book to describe farmers who were had been conventional farmers, but who had adopted regenerative practices, things like the combination of no-till and cover crops and diversifying their rotations. And they were able to so reduce their fertilizer use and their pesticide use that I started teasing them that they were organic-ish farmers. Um, and you know, they're not all that different from organic farmers, mm -hmm. um, except they will still use those those uh, chemical tools as they refer to them on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can take your fertilizer use and reduce it by 50 to 90%, or you can reduce your glyphosate use by 50 to 90%, if you could do that across the world of conventional agriculture, it would have a huge impact on the land. Excellent. An important takeaway for me from your book, Growing a Revolution, was the fact that farmers typically need to do three of the practices uh, together in order to see the, the, the soil improvement. In other words, if you only do no-till, or if you're, if you're only doing cover crops, or, or you know, but you're not also you know, doing those two plus rotating the crops uh, using uh, diversity of, of cover crops, then you're not likely to see consistently the soil health benefits. Yeah, and that, that was one of those revelations to me that um, came across not only in interviewing farmers, but also in digging into the published peer-reviewed literature around things like rebuilding uh, organic matter contents and soils like uh, crop yields. Um, if you just do no-till, it's not guaranteed that you'll actually increase your soil organic matter content. It depends on a lot on what other things you're doing. Like if you're basically going no-till but exporting the crop stubble to a biofuel plant, you're not putting it back in the ground. Um, and a lot of the carbon that's actually fixed, that, that is uh, built in soils, is done through the, the exudates through plant roots and it's the dead body, the accumulated dead bodies of microbes in the, the soil. Necromass. The necromass, yes, exactly, a great term. All the dead stuff that is essentially full of nutrients and full of carbon because it once it was alive and can be recycled into things that can support future, um, future growth, but that um, 
if you just adopt one of those practices, you don't get the full benefit of the, the full suite of all three. And there's actually, I think, a fairly simple reason why those three things of minimal disturbance, keeping living roots in the, in the soil, keeping cover crops growing. You don't see nature uh, farming naked very often. Plants tend to cover soil. Um, and having a diverse community, is that's a recipe, those three things, for cultivating a beneficial community of life in the soil. And that's the recipe for essentially enhancing nutrient cycling, for benefiting chemical signaling, um, for getting the full benefit of that suite of regenerative practices. Great. And I see we have a question. I'm here with my colleague, Soil for Climate co-founder Seth Hitzkan. And Seth is going to share one of the questions from a, a viewer. So, Seth? Um, can... Hi, David. Thank you for being here. No, hey, that's, sure. That's fine. You can keep your yeah, camera on him. There's Seth, yeah. Seth is over by the <laughs> over there. I, I'll just say the question loud. Uh, Carrie from Greece um, is working with rocky soils, and she'd like to plant some trees. And she's wondering if there are certain tree species that you work with and also what kind of ground covers you use. Oh, well, I'm a geologist. <laughs> so the short, the short answer is uh, there are not specific tree species that I work with. I'm probably the wrong person to give you a solid answer on that. But what I, I can suggest is that you know, if you're basically trying to build up bare rocky soil, that's what we started with in our yard. We basically had bare rocky dirt. Uh, and getting a, as organic matter from wherever you can to basically get back in terms of compost and mulch and then uh, uh, using that as a platform to then start building your trees and your shrubs and your understory on. And think of it as a polyculture. You want sort of like a, a ground cover, you perhaps want a mid cover and you want trees and a diversity of, of all of them, depending on what you're trying to do with, with that lot and whether it's an agricultural production, in which case, you know, very particular uh, uh, crops at each of those levels would be what you'd be looking at. Um, but I'm not gonna be able to give you terribly great advice about which trees to grow in a particular part of Greece. Can I ask another question? Okay, we have a question now from Mark in New Zealand. So uh, it, one of my favorite countries. So we're, it's, it's exciting that we're getting questions from around the world, Greece yeah. and New Zealand. Um, Mark is simply asking if you're seeing a demand increasing for regenerative products. And he also just wants to say great books. He, so he's read your books as well. <laughs> Hey, well, th thank you. Uh, 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 every author l absolutely loves to hear that from readers. And, you know, for any of you out there who have read the books and are, are and like that, thank you very much. That helps keep me writing. Um, the So in terms of the demand for regenerative agriculture, um, yes, I'm seeing when I first wrote the dirt book about 10 years ago, it was back in 2007, I think it came out. The, the regenerative agriculture movement was embryonic uh, in terms of where it stands today. There was very little discussion of soil health, very little discussion of sort of soil in the whole climate problem. There's a lot of action around it, it today. Um, we still have a long way to go today. There's probably only about three or four percent of U.S. farmers that are practicing that full suite of uh, you know, minimal disturbance, cover crops, and diverse rotations. But there's something like a third of U.S. farmers that have gone no-till. Many, many more of them are starting to go towards uh, cover crops. And then it's just one more step to get in that diversity of their rotations. Uh, and one of the best things we could do for human health is to grow a more diverse suite of foods and not grow so much corn and soybeans. What's good for the land will actually be good for us as well. And so one of the reasons that Ann and I are working on this new book on uh, soil health and human health is to look at the connection between the quality of soil and the quality of food that's grown for human consumption. Um, because it's, it's our belief that if, if we can connect those dots um, and people recognize that better quality food is grown in this matter, it will actually help spur consumer demand. So I think there's sort of two elements to, to fueling the demand for regenerative farming. One is on the consumer end, and that's having consumers desire it and demand it, and that will very much help. But the other is on the farmer end and the policy end. So maybe there's really actually three angles. On the farmer end, I see growing interest in reducing fertilizer bills, in reducing pesticide bills, and reducing herbicide bills, um, because it's my perception that modern conventional farmers are squeezed between low commodity prices because they've become so good at growing so much of so few things that they do not get a great price for what they are growing. And that the 
the, the real cost in real dollars of the fertilizer, the diesel, and the pesticides and the patented seeds that they need to buy to be conventional farmers have increased. So they're squeezed in the middle. Uh, a lot of the farmers I interviewed for Growing a Revolution were basically very, very interested in reducing their fertilizer bill as sort of their one way into thinking about regenerative agriculture. Um, and then seeing the benefits to their soil, the improvement in their soil health or soil fertility, really helped motivate them to keep going and adopt the full suite of things. So I, I see several avenues to the demand for regenerative agriculture. The one I think we could see a lot more for, hopefully, is at the policy level. And that's where there's some actually some, some promising discussions happening among some politicians who are not yet in office in the US uh, that are looking at regenerative farming as part of the so-called Green New Deal. Um, there's real opportunities to have win-win-win solutions, not only for improving farm profitability, but for improving um, climate aspects, and sequestering carbon in the soil, but also I think improving human health by growing more better, more nutritious, more diverse arrays of food. These are things that at a societal level, the more we talk about them, the more interest there is in them, if we can fuel those three elements of demand, consumer demand, farmer demand, and sort of policy leadership, if you will, um, that will really help move the ball forward. So we have a long way to go, but compared to where we were just a few years ago, it's changing fast. And it's one of the nice things about being a geologist is if I can see change over five or 10 years, I can think that's really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most famous regenerative farmers in America, Gabe Brown of North Dakota, uh, in addressing the issue of regenerative farming being more profitable for him, uh, often likes to say that he'd rather sign the back of the checks than the front of the checks. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great line. Uh, one other issue I'd like to get to before we take the next question is that of, of testing soil. Um, how do you determine how much carbon there is in it? Um, how is it expensive for a farmer to, to go through that process? Are there different ways being codified? And perhaps you could talk on that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the odd thing about measuring the carbon content of soils is it's both really easy and it's terribly complicated. Um, and it's really easy because uh, you can literally take like a coffee can, drive it into the ground, fill it full of soil, so you have a known volume of soil. You can basically weigh it, you then stick it in the oven at 80 to 100 degrees overnight, burn off the carbon, um, weigh it again, and you've basically figured out what your carbon content was, because it's the difference, it's what's missing, it's sort of the loss on ignition uh, kind of test. And you don't need a terribly sophisticated lab to do it, you can send it to a soils lab and they'll do it for you and with, you know, following standard procedures, and it's probably a better idea than doing it at home. Um, but so the basic idea of a soil organic matter test, a soil carbon test, is not terribly difficult, not terribly expensive. Um, but the question of how would you characterize that over your entire farm, mm -hmm. you know, across a landscape, where do you measure it? How many samples do you need? Uh, like what depth, so what depth do you yeah. measure that? Cause it's going to be different at the surface and it will change going down. And as a, what, one of the things I've seen on regenerative farms I've visited is that as you increase the carbon content of the soil, it not only increases in content near the surface, but it deepens the, the a horizon. And you can think of soils as having an O horizon, the organic material at the top, and an A horizon that's a mix of organic matter and mineral matter. That th Those two together define your topsoil. You get down to the B, it's the subsoil, the C horizon, it's rotten rock. Um, where you're really building the carbon content is in the topsoil, but you can thicken the topsoil and you can increase its ca carbon content. So it can be complicated to measure if you're trying to characterize it and, and to measure it over time. It actually varies seasonally. It will vary year to year. Um, and so you have this signal that's changing, it's oscillating. How often do you measure it? What are you trying to get at? Um, there's a lot of strategy that goes with that, which of course plays into ideas of paying farmers to put carbon in the ground. How do you do the accounting? That's the complicated part. The simple part is just measuring the amount at one sample at one time. There are proxy indicators, the infiltration rate, uh, return of biodiversity, plant counts. I don't know how closely they correlate to what's going on underground. Yeah, I mean, there's, you can look at various aspects of soil quality. Uh, the infiltration rate, for example, the, the rate at which water will sink into the soil is a good measure, essentially. Well, it's really measuring is the connectivity of the void spaces. And what's the best way to build connected void spaces in the soil? have worms burrowing in it, have life digging in it, it creates those spaces. 
you can keep those spaces open if you have mycorrhizal fungi secreting compounds like lomalin. Keep that sticky. That, that keep it sticky and hold those uh, the soil aggregates together. Um, there's a lot that goes into building uh, soil structure, which isn't always related to carbon content. But if you think of soil carbon as the fuel that drives the soil life, I mean, it's what they eat. It's what they become. It's the back half of the, the circle of life. Um, if you think of carbon as the fuel for the underground economy, and it's the bustliness, the busyness of that economy that's creating the structure that allows water to sink into the ground, then you start to see the ways that they can be they can be uh, related to each other, but they're not exactly the same so thing. Yeah. So it's and and if you look at soil organic matter content, so the different soils around the world. You, there's no sort of magic number for what a good soil organic matter content is. It very much depends on what part of the world you're in, what climate you're in, what kind of bedrock you have. Um, and so it's like if you have a three or four percent soil organic matter in the tropics, that's really good because it's hard to keep carbon in the tropics. If you're basically doing that in the, uh, you know, in the, the grasslands of the American Midwest, three percent is not terribly good because they started out at probably six to eight or ten. So it's very context dependent. Gotcha. All right. I think we'll take another question now. So it's exciting that we're getting questions from around the world. Um, this question is from Heidi in Wisconsin. I'm going to give you two right now. Um, she wants to know if taking ash from the wood burner is good to mix into acidic sandy soil. And she's in Northwest Wisconsin. So taking ash, wood ash, basically yeah. to mix soil. Yeah. So just hold on and let me give okay. you that's one question the other question is from pedro in port in portugal we're wonder, glad that he's watching and he wants to know uh what's the status of agroforestry or sort of alley cropping in your opinion at this moment so two okay totally two okay let questions. me do the second one first sure. and then i'll try and remember the first one yeah the first one um, was about the wood ash i'll remind you about yeah that. great so in terms of agroforestry there's a chapter in growing a revolution where i visit an agroforestry operation in costa rica i was incredibly impressed with it the the gentleman there had basically turned his his farm into uh essentially a food forest there was an, an under two levels of understory and a tree canopy that uh, almost everything there was a crop and the amount of, of not just food that he was able to produce for his own family and his own sale, and, and a lot of his commercial value was in terms of growing cacao on the property, but the wildlife in that farm was amazing. I saw river otters, I saw the poisoned, you know, little blue frogs that I probably did not want to be licking. Um, there was uh, all kinds of life in that jungle. Um, and this was a working farm. Um, and that's very different than if you go out to, you know, sort of a typical North American uh, corn and soybean plantation where there's hardly any life left. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very impressed with that, and particularly as a style of, of uh, sustainable farming, well suited for the tropics. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some really great operations. Now, that said, there's a lot of room to think about bringing these back into agriculture in, the, in temperate regions and even in sort of row cropping operations, particularly uh, on sort of uh, in, as wind breaks between things. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to reintegrate uh, uh, trees into agriculture and that that would actually very much help with building the fungal populations. And I've seen some interesting studies lately and results looking at the sort of the fungal bacterial ratio in soils and sort of looking at the advantages of a fungal dominant soil for crop production mm -hmm. and trees would help with that as would not plowing and not using glyphosate but those are other issues as well and so then the other question seth was wood, about wood, uh, ash, or wood or ash wood ash um you know I, i'm probably not the perfect person to ask that question but i think uh the first question i would ask is like well what's the source of the wood you know if it's creosoted wood don't <laughs> um but you don't want to be burning that either and you probably already knew that um but if it's basically clean wood, I mean, what happens when you combust wood is you're venting off a lot of the carbon that goes to the atmosphere. You're venting off some of the oxygen along with it. Um, some of the nitrogen gets lost, but a lot of the mineral elements are retained in that ash. And that's how a lot of the early sort of analyses of, you know, what's in a plant were done. Well, you burn it and see what's left over. Um, and so if you're thinking about the returning mineral elements to the soil, that's actually a pretty good way to do it. Now, in terms of doing it to an acidic soil, I, yeah, I think that's good 
Uh, I wouldn't totally trust my judgment on that. That's a little outside of my normal wheelhouse. A, a good agronomist ought to be able to tell you whether that's a great idea or a crazy idea. But just in terms of returning mineral elements that are needed for growing new life, ash is a great way to do that. Yeah. Responding to a point you made a, a few minutes ago, for me, one of the exciting aspects of regenerative agriculture is restoring wildlife habitat on yeah. working farms. And we see that too, not just in agroforestry situations, but in the case of uh, better pasture management, uh, where the cows may only be spending a few days out of the year on a given patch of land, and the other 97, 98% of the time, it's available for use by the wildlife and the birds and the beaver and all of the deer and the other animals. And the, the grass to regrow. And the grass to regrow. I saw a great uh, drone video shot of a, a bison farm up in Manitoba, and uh, the husband and wife farmers estimate there's some 200 deer now living in this paddock that until a few years earlier had basically been depleted. Uh, oh, interesting, soybean, interesting. In, in so they're raising a whole nother type of livestock they hadn't planned on. It, exactly. Yeah, and, well, and deer's good to eat too, so. And there are some farmers who are uh, adopting these principles, not as Seth and myself are primarily concerned with the climate aspects of it, um, but because they love wildlife and they yeah. want to leave a better farm uh, farm in better condition uh, to their children you know, for their part of their legacy and uh, so there are so many wonderful reasons to do this um, in you know the economics the wildlife and so forth um, I would like to hear a little bit more about some of the the farmers and the ranches that you've been working with and uh, the visits that you had I know you've gone all over the world uh, so you, there are plenty to choose from but yeah, no, for, for growing a revolution, um, I literally took six months off from teaching at the University of Washington and uh, traveled to visit farmers in Costa Rica, in Equatorial Africa, uh, and across North America. Uh, and why did I stop there? Well, I ran out of money. That's where, that's where the budget disappeared to. Um, but I was very impressed with the, the consistency of the, the high level sort of principles behind their very successful operations at restoring healthy fertile soil to their farms. And those boil down to those three principles we were talking about in terms of minimal disturbance, cover crops, and, and at first rotation. Some of them were also reintegrating livestock into their operations. Um, and you know, there's this big change in the Western world in the 1940s and 30s and 40s where we started to uh, basically separate animal husbandry from crop production and Farmers would specialize in either ranching or, or row cropping. And that basically took out, took animals off the land and took off a, what I've now come to see is essentially an accelerant for building soil quality and for building soil organic matter. Um, and that is essentially running the, the remains of crops or cover crops through a ruminant's gut, producing it as manure, and then getting that back into the soil to feed the soil food web. Um, and this is something that not all the farmers I visited were doing. So I'm not, you don't have to necessarily have animals in operation to be regenerative, but I think it helps you do it faster. Um, and so for farmers who are in a position to actually do that, it can make a lot of sense. And I saw this on you know, some of the smaller farms and also some of the larger farms, people do it in different ways. Um, but that went 100% against sort of what I was trained to think. I was going to say, I recall reading that at first you were skeptical that oh, I was very skeptical. Be I was very skeptical because mm -hmm. I'd done a good part of my PhD research, you know, uh, not far from here. We're sitting in the mission in San Francisco. I did part of my PhD research in the Marin County headlands up in uh, up Tennessee Valley, where I studied the erosion of deep gullies into the landscape and tried to figure out, well, when were they carved? You know, what caused them? Was it a climate shift? Was it grazing? There were various hypotheses. I was able to basically get down into the gullies, find, look at the sediments, because you know, I'm a geologist, so that's what I do. I, I dig holes and look at stuff. Uh, and it's basically able to document that the rivers in that area of coastal California had been down, you know, about 30, 40 feet deeper than they are today, down about bedrock at the, the la end of the last ice age. And they were flowing on bedrock. And how do I know that? Because they found the river gravels down there, got carbon to carbon to it. I think carbon to that the, um, the walls of the gullies, all the way up that to the top, and you could see the gradual rise of the valley bottom as, the, as essentially the valley filled in with sediment um, when the redwood forest was converted to grassland naturally at the end of the last big climate change, at the end of the ice age, more sediment was produced than the river could carry, so the valley filled up. Mm -hmm. That's sort of simple geology. Then when you get to the very top, only about two feet down from the top, there's a layer of cow bones 
Okay, <laughs> that says something. Which tells you something, and we know that the ca cattle were, not in, were introduced in the in the late 18th century in California, but they didn't. You can go back and look at tax records, and you see that the peak in cow abundance was about 1880 in Marin County, and it was it was da uh, dairy operations that ran their cattle in. Uh, they basically let them roam wherever, and so the cattle stayed in the in the valley bottom because that's where the water was. So they mostly overgrazed the valley bottom. And the rivers cut right back down to bedrock. Hmm. And they did it over the course of just a few years. And I was able to find archaeological documents from surveys that were done in the 1890s and 19 oh, 19-aughts, 1904 or 5, if I recall, where archaeologists have, who had been looking for Native American evidence of Native American settlements used the incised bellies as their tool to prospect, because that's where you could see all the sediments. And so I put the story together and went like, wow, these bellies fell apart at the peak of grazing. So I was sure that grazing- Plenty of evidence that grazing can, evidence, can cause yeah. harm if it's not done well. Exactly, and the revelation to me at visiting like Gabe Brown's farm, for example, the gentleman you mentioned earlier, who was very generous with his time with me uh, in showing me his, his operation and how he's using his uh, livestock as a means to regenerate native prairie. Um, he basically convinced me um, and, and others that I visited around the same time that the problem wasn't the grazing the problem was how the grazing was done the problem was the people that were managing the grazing it's the cow not the how uh, no it's, it's the a, how not the cow oh, yeah, it's the how not I've the cow practicing that oh. too oh. um I, we'd like to take one more question then we need to wrap this up so seth if you want to join us here sure great by the way there, there's another version of um it's the how not the cow or it's not the cow it's the how and that um it's not the meat, it's the motion. <laughs> and that, that one's been around for a while. Okay, uh, so now here's a question from Uruguay, and it's exciting yeah, right. that they're coming in from all over. This is from Ashley in Uruguay. Uh, I'm just gonna read the whole thing. She says, if we take as an assumption that we need to move away from tillage, do you think we could make an argument of moving toward a human diet entirely made from perennials like the food forest you mentioned and regenerative animal ag, something like managed hunter gather gatherer diet. I think it's a very interesting idea. And I think, yes, it would be feasible to do, and it would probably be healthier for us to do that. Um, the, you know, we eat an awful lot of refined carbohydrates in the developed world, and that's demonstrably not good for our health. And we probably, we eat too much processed meat. So the idea of eating a more diverse diet that was rich in fruits and vegetables, but that still had some meat in it, if that meat was grown regeneratively, I could see how that all together could make for not only uh, better land quality, better soil quality and soil health, but it could also translate into a better diet for us. And that's, that's essentially stuff that Ann and I are looking into uh, in the new book. I go a little ways into that in, in Growing a Revolution, but there's, there's more dots to connect. And so, yeah, I think that that vision that you're offering is a very intriguing one. And there's a lot to go, there's a lot to be said for it. Excellent. Well, I just want to say thank you again, David. It's been a pleasure to be show, with you. Show the book again. Hold the book. And here's All right. the book, yeah, Growing a Revolution. And the new one will be coming out sometime in the future. Yeah, Growing a Revolution, the paperback's out now. The new one will probably be called You Are What Your Food Ate. And it will be coming out probably about six months after Ann and I finish writing it. Sounds great. Well, we look forward to hearing your keynote address tonight. If you're thank in you. the San Francisco area, join us at the Soil Not Oil Conference. And we'd like to thank Miguel Robles for putting this wonderful event together. And thanks again to my colleague Seth Itzkan for helping out with this live stream uh, broadcast. And we hope uh, to see you joining us in the next podcast as well. So long, everybody. Okay, I think we're stuck.